Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Hello, hello, you're listening to Movie Oubliette, episode 62, the globe-spanning movie review podcast with me, Dan, having a taste of the joys of wearing a mask in summer in Melbourne, Australia. And me, Conrad, fighting the urge to draw a smiley face on my mask in Cambridge, UK. <laughs> In this podcast, we discuss long-lost genre films, sci-fi, horror, and fantasy, because nothing makes us smile more than autonomous mobile swords, 90s CGI, and post-nuclear war sci-fi film sets that look like they're just metallic spray-painted cardboard. (laughs) Conrad, how are you today? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. It's getting warmer here, and I get to wear shorts. (laughs) So I'm happy. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so are there legs on display underneath? The, yeah, you know, down there. Down there somewhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's something that our audience can fantasise about while they listen. <laughs> oh, but I haven't shaved, though. <laughs> Oh, dear. Well, we've been getting a great reaction to our antiviral episode. Oh, yes. Joe Lipset of the Horror Quiz, who we had as a guest on the episode about The Relic, he retweeted us and pointed out, this is such an odd little film, but the timing of this episode is perfect because Brandon's latest movie, Possessor, comes out next month. Ah, so that's very exciting. Yeah, we did that on purpose, didn't we? Yeah, let's <laughs> say <of>. we did. <laughs> let's say we did. It's going to be in the London Film Festival, which because of good old COVID-19 oh, yes. is going to be online a lot this year or online as well as some sort of socially distanced screenings. Right. And Possessor is in the lineup. So I'm hoping to get online tickets to see that. Oh, it looks intense it does yeah that's really interesting sort of a body swapping mind controlly type of paranoid thriller so yeah I, I, yeah yeah that pushes a few of my buttons oh like yeah stuff the premise looks awesome <laughs> and they're also showing relic at the london film festival which i'm oh, really keen to see yeah the aussie film yes. yeah not the relic that we did with the horror quiz but the other <laughs> relic without the the, the new relic <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's confusing. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's like the new Batman movies, The Batman, isn't it? That's how they're differentiating Robert Pattinson right. as Batman. Yeah. He's The Batman. Another piece of exciting news, we got a new review on iTunes. Oh, yeah. We love your reviews, by the way. We do. It makes a huge difference to us because it sort of promotes the podcast to other listeners as they're browsing. Yeah, boosts our ego. It does, yeah. We need that. We do. (laughs) Yes, so we got a new review from Cody8 in the US, and they gave us five stars and said, this is one of the few movie podcasts I will listen to no matter which movie they're covering. Dan and Conrad's chemistry is so natural, and they always choose amazing guests. They are always reliably entertaining. So there you oh, go. Oh, that's so nice. It's really nice. I isn't feel it? like we're doing the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's really affirming to know that people are actually enjoying the show out there. So thanks for that, Cody 8. Yes, please. More reviews from anyone else that likes us. Anything else in the mailbag, Conrad? (laughs) Yes, we've been getting great responses to our social media question about which is your favourite viral related movie. We put up a montage of various different movie posters like 12 Monkeys and Omega Man, Children of Men. 
and we got some great responses. Dystopica said, Carpenter's The Thing is a classic and hits those paranoia notes so well. And I hmm. hadn't thought of The Thing as a viral movie, but I guess it is. Yeah, wow. I've never really thought about it like that. Yeah, I think it could be. It's a good call. Yeah. Also, Dystopica mentioned special affection for 10 Cloverfield Lane, which is a different ah. kind of paranoia, i.e. is this even happening? Yes. So, that movie's amazing. It is. So good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, just imagine John Goodman locking you up in lockdown and telling you there's COVID-19 out there and you have to stay indoors. Yeah. Would you believe him? Yeah. Now you would, I guess. Yeah, I, and imagine if you suddenly broke free and it's just aliens. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gotten to that stage yet, but <laughs> given the way 2020 has been treating us so far, I would not put it past them. Mm, that's true. That's true. And finally, of course, we heard from Cold Crash Pictures. Hello, sir. Uh, yes. Hey, Serge. <laughs> Who said, Antiviral is by no means a bad film, but for me, it's got two serious issues that hit from both sides. It doesn't quite sell me on its premise that there's a massive market for people who will buy celebrity illnesses. And I don't think it explores that premise far enough. Sometimes I'll hold off on even the most lukewarm criticism of a film by telling myself it's just my opinion, but then Movie Oubliette will go and put exactly what I'm feeling into words so I know I'm not alone. Uh, <laughs> that's why we're doing this. Yes. <laughs> so I think he's right. It's not entirely convincing because the movie's a little bit tongue-in-cheek and black humour-y, mm. but also it doesn't really go very far in exploring every implication of the ideas it's putting forward. Yeah. There's loads of ideas, though. But not a bad movie, though. No, not a bad movie at all, and I'm looking forward to Possessor. Mm, me too. So what do I have to look forward to today, Dan? What are we doing today? Yes, well, I'll just go get it. <laughs> okay, there's a some sort of rocket spaceship in here for some reason. Launch sequence initiated. Countdown's a bit scary. Oh, it's counting down. Right. Uh, I think the movie's strapped to it. Hang on. Pre-launch bird complete. 90 seconds to launch. Oh, it was a pre-launch? Is that a thing? Oh, handy for toasting marshmallows, <laughs> maybe. Well, I've got the movie. <laughs> and there's a scary kid in here as well. Can I come with you? No, thank you. I'm getting out of here. Jessica Hansen, Pittsburgh. How do you do? Okay, I'm back. Yes, wow, gosh. That was a narrow escape. What have you got for us? Today I have the 1995 sci-fi horror, hmm. I guess you would say, the film Screamers. Ooh. It's uh, directed by Christian Duguay. Duguay? Duguay? He's a French-Canadian director, so properly uh, pronouncing that wrong. Mm. And it's uh, it's actually based on a short story called Second Variety by none other than Philip K. Dick. Wow. Who has had a lot of movies adapted <laughs> from his uh, short stories and, and novels. So Yes, I remember you went through a phase of trying to watch all of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I have. I think I've watched all of his movies apart from one which is pretty much impossible to find. Um, but I ha have yet to watch any of the TV shows that have been adapted. So mm. uh, Electric Dreams and The Man in the High Castle, which is mm. both supposed to be really good. And who's the cast and crew for Screamers? So the screenplay was done by Dan O'Bannon, who has done Ooh. a fair number of very, very good movies. Uh, Alien... Mm. Total Recall, some other ones like Life Force and Dead and Buried. The other screenwriter is Miguel Tejada Flores, mm. who has done some other movies, yeah. Revenge of the Nerds, Fright Night 2, oh. and <laughs> Beyond Reanimator, apparently, as well. Oh, uh, So this movie, Screamers, stars Peter Weller of uh, Robocop fame, uh, Roy mm. Dupuis, Jennifer Rubin, Andrew Lauer, Charles Edwin Powell and Ron White. Mm. Screamers set in the future. The year is 2078 on planet mm. Sirius 6B. A 10 year war wages with the mining company NEB clashing against the Alliance over the energy source Berinium. However, the sought after element releases deadly radiation and coupled with the destruction from war, the planet is now a barren wasteland Ooh. 
With the hopes of a peace treaty detailed in a message from the enemy NEB, Commander Joe Hendrickson and rookie Ace Jefferson journey across enemy lines to negotiate a deal. Oh, by the way, the movie is called Screamers, so there's plenty of those delightful lethal mechanised murder devices that burrow through the ground and strike with very grisly consequences. Mm. But there isn't just one type of screamer. A rock could be one. A child could be one. Maybe I'm a screamer. Are you a screamer, Conrad? Well, (laughs) could be. (laughs) We're going to find out who's a screamer in this film after the break. (laughs) Where's my earplugs? <laughs> and we're back to talk about the 1995 horror sci-fi Screamers. Stars Peter Weller of Robocop. Mm. I don't really know him that well. I mean, he was pretty good in this film. Conrad, you haven't seen this film. What were your first impressions and did you like Peter Weller? I do like (laughs) Peter Weller. I think he's a very serious actor. Most of the time he tends to go for dramas and when he does touch on sci-fi, I think he looks for films that have got a little bit more to them than the popcorn munching throwaway movie Mm -hmm. so when he looked at the screenplay for robocop i think his agent said oh it's just some robot movie but he read it and he'd seen all of paul verhoeven's movies right so he knew what he was going to do with it he knew it was going to be a savage satire of 80s capitalism and yuppie culture Mm -hmm. so he signed on and it became his signature role yes but he's done lots of other fascinating things like naked lunch for david cronenberg which is an amazing movie oh so strange it is it's very very strange Mm. so when you see him attach himself to a sci-fi movie you think okay he doesn't pick his roles lightly this must be a fairly interesting movie and given that it's based on a philip k dick story Mm. you think okay this is going to tackle some lofty themes you know like blade runner so it's going to be what is real and what isn't real Mm. and what does it mean to be human that's usually the kind of territory you're tackling and yes it's true they are here in evidence in this movie. Yeah, I love the themes that Philip K. Dick always touches on. The sort of blurring the lines between what is real and what isn't real and what is humanity, like asking Mm. us as an audience, what is it to be human? If a robot has feelings, does that make that robot human in that respect? And yeah, I think the general core of the film, because it's based on Philip K. Dick, there is a lot there. But I'm not sure about the execution of those themes. <laughs> Peter Weller's character, <laughs> Hendrickson, does stand out as probably the best character of the film because mm. everyone else either seems so cliche it's hilarious yeah, or just terribly acted. Yeah. And cardboard. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, get into spoilers straight away. The film does have a problem that everybody turns out to be a robot. So maybe it's fair that they're all crap. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Like it had those kind of cliche characters that you always find in these sci-fis where they a big group of people go out to investigate something and then all hell breaks loose and everyone kind of slots into these characters so there's always the douchebag who is becker in this Mm -hmm. there's always the hard-nosed reluctant hero who is hendrickson and there's always the guy that just freaks the hell out and is terrified who is um the ross character and then there's always the pretty girl that is pretty girl yeah and of course that love story just seems so shoehorned in there that it's hilarious when they start kissing because i just (laughs) didn't see that coming (laughs) at all no i do love jennifer rubin who i primarily know as being taryn from nightmare on elm street 3 she plays the drug addict who is beautiful and bad Uh I love Taryn in that movie. And she's really good in this movie, I think, playing this sort of hard-nosed black market trader who ends up being the leader of this ragtag leftover bunch of guys from the other side. I have to admit, I could never figure out exactly who the two armies were 
or what they represented. I mean, the war just seems confounded how it started. I mean, they discover a radioactive element that will end all energy crises, Mm. except it pollutes everything and the miners don't want to work. So they start a war, a nuclear war on a planet because of pretty much a strike. Yeah. Is that correct? I think that's what they're (laughs) doing. It seems a bit... Yeah. (laughs) Blow it out of proportion. Come yeah, on. <laughs> I know. And it's just overly complicated. I mean, I did like the whole thing that when Philip K. Dick wrote the short story, it was the Cold War. It yes. was Russia versus America. And it was actually set on Earth. And Earth was the smoldering aftermath of this nuclear exchange. And whereas here you've got Sirius 6B or whatever it's called. And, mm. and it's another planet. And the big reveal some way through the movie is is that they've just been left there hung out to dry, that the company has found another source of this beryllium and they've just moved on. And so they're just sending fake messages to them with new orders or whatever, and it's holograms of people that are dead now or something. Right. Yeah. I was confused about that whole sort of situation. Yeah. It makes sense now that you yeah. sort of lay it out. I feel really dumb now. No. Um, no because, no. yeah, I was trying to figure out why the spaceship had, like, crash-landed, but they were heading to a different planet. Yeah. But they'd just forgotten about this planet. They just thought, well, we can't be bothered with that one anymore, so we just leave them to kill each other, especially now that one faction has unleashed these killer robots that evolve by themselves. Yeah. So they've been hung out to dry. I like that aspect. It reminded me of Moon. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, that lonely guy who's carrying on this pointless mission for this faceless corporation that doesn't care about him and is just lying to him all the time. It reminded me of that very much. Mm, Right, right, right. I was confused by the opening scene Mm. because they introduce a whole bunch of characters that don't continue on for the rest of the movie. So why isn't Peter Weller in that opening scene? I know. I don't understand. No. It confused me Mm. because I didn't know who the main character was. No. I thought that ragtag group of people in that bunker were going to be the ones that go off. Yeah. And never see them again. <laughs> you never see them again. No, no. Instead, you get Hendrickson and then a character that's not even introduced until like, what, 15 minutes into the film? Yeah. They go off instead. So it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. I did like the premise of The Screamers, though. Mm. Obviously, Philip K. Dick came up with that. Having these sort of mechanized killing devices, machines that burrow on the ground, and the fact that they're... Are they updating themselves? Yeah. They're sort of upgrading themselves and continuing to reproduce almost like an organism even though they're completely mechanical yeah that's right and it ties into some trends that we have now like i remember seeing reports that google invented these ais that evolved their own language and encrypted it in order to talk to each other and effectively locked the human beings out of the loop oh, wow. okay. and, and then you start thinking but what are they planning <laughs> <laughs> yes. so there is this whole thing that we have now that if we create technology that can evolve itself, machine learning, in order to do a job more efficiently than we could even imagine, it will sprout up and do odd things in odd ways and have effects that we didn't anticipate. I mean, certainly something I touched on in our last episode, the effect the social media algorithms on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook has had on our societies as a whole is not something that we expected when we started out. Mm -hmm. So I like that idea. I like the idea of this factory of robots. I mean, it's a very 80s thing to have it being a physical robot rather than AI. Yes. But to have this factory, I think Peter Weller's character Hendrickson says they basically pushed the button and ran. Yeah, that's right. They're down there manufacturing and nobody knows what they're doing. Yeah, I did like the twists in this movie. Mm. I thought they were just kind of revealed in odd ways. Yeah. So the first twist is the child that they find. David, I think he's called, ends up being a screamer. But it's revealed in a not-so-twisty way. I mean, so they end up in the NEB base and they shoot David and it's kind of shocking that they've just shot a child. Yes. Um, But then he turns out to be a screamer. But I thought they could have almost prolonged it a little bit so that it would have been much more of a, whoa, that was a twist. Yeah. But it was kind of revealed too early. Yeah. I do like seeing them blow this 12-year-old kid out of his (laughs) socks. It's a bit of a shocker. Yes. 
Yeah, it's not, not something the... you see often. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> the second twist of Becca being a screamer, I thought was, well, it was almost like they knew we were going to expect him to be a screamer, but then they did it anyway. So it's like a double red herring, if that's a... <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it doesn't work. I mean, he has that whole thing where he falsely accuses somebody else, but the other person that he accuses is the Hudson character that's panicking and mm. scared all the time. Yeah. So... It just doesn't make any sense that he would be. Yes. And then, spoilers, right at the end, yeah. it's Jessica too. Yeah, but then she, her version has fallen in love with Hendrickson, and so another Jessica turns up yeah. to be the evil one because you can't have the, <laughs> the love interest be the evil one. No. Because the love interest, it's the love story of this film. Yeah. You can't have them be evil. That would have been way cooler if she ended up just being evil. And he would have been heartbroken. Yeah. But no. Which would have been the ex machina ending, which is the female looking robot has been leading the main character along the whole movie Mm. just to manipulate them into getting what they want, which in Alex Garland's movie is terrifying. Yes. Really terrifying. Yes. I think that would have been a cool ending. I mean, (laughs) we don't want to talk about the ending straight away, but I mean... (laughs) Well, first of all, it's too long. I mean, there are just too many twists. Yeah. Everybody is a robot. There is so much time spent. Sort of like, and now he's a robot. And now his best friend from the base is a robot. Uh, yeah. And now Jessica's a robot. And here's another Jessica. And it's going to be the Jessica girl on girl fight yeah. for 20 minutes. Yeah. And then, like, the final shot of the movie, the teddy bear's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no. <laughs> I have to ask about his fellow commander ends up being a robot, but he's still got the teardrop from Becca. So did Becca steal his face? He just like stole his face and stuck it on his face and then re-tattooed the same eye drop on his new face. Which completely gives him away? Yeah. What? Um, <laughs> and I didn't understand why Jessica turned up because they were arguing over who gets to go back to Earth because the escape ship, surprise, surprise, only has one seat in it. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to get Jessica to go. No, you go. I'll stay behind. Mm. It doesn't matter how we flip the coin. You're going. So she's going to get what she wants. So another Jessica turns up and ruins it and blows the whole thing? Yeah. I didn't get that. I mean, my understanding was there was the good Jessica and then there was the evil twin Jessica that shows up. Right. So the good Jessica was scared of what she was going to do, whether she was going to do the right thing because of her programming. Mm. Uh, My biggest problem with this film is they set all these rules and they just broke all the rules. Right, yeah. So, you know, you've got screamers, they're all mechanised, they don't have organs, they don't bleed, they can't consume food, but then Becca just drinks alcohol, fine. Yeah, Somehow processes that. And then Jessica bleeds, fine. Yes. And has some sort of internal organs. So the twist weren't sort of justified. There wasn't like a way that they revealed that, oh, actually he wasn't drinking the alcohol, he was pouring it over his shoulder, or yeah. she wasn't actually bleeding, <laughs> she just had a blood sachet in her hand or something. You know, there was no sort of... <laughs> Ketchup or something. Yeah, there was no backup to how they got through it. They just, screamers can do that now, you know, screamers can bleed and have sex and have feelings and fall in love. And drink alcohol. Yes. They can do anything. They can be a teddy bear. Yeah. Oh, the teddy bear, though. I mean, that's just... Uh, why? <laughs> why make a scream a teddy bear? What's it going to do? See, now I'm imagining the terrible events on Earth when Hendrickson arrives, whereby this three-inch high teddy bear destroys humanity. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. what, what exactly was it expecting to do? It's a dumb ending. It's yeah. a terrible, oh, it's, terrible it's ending. It's an awful ending. <laughs> but you're right, they don't follow the rules at all. And I don't think they really do a great job of characterising the screamers. No, they don't. It's established that they will kill any humans unless they're wearing this bracelet which has LED lights on, which supposedly sort of tags them in some way as a good guy Mm. that they shouldn't attack. Yeah. Because they were created by one side 
to kill the other side. But they just kill everyone. Yeah, then, then they just start killing everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's that whole thing of, you know, in war games in 1983 and in the Terminator in 84, they imagine if we build these uh, AIs, these robots, they're going to at some point decide that it's not just one faction of humans that are the problem, it's all of them and we're just going to wipe the ball out. Mm. So it's that old trope, which, you know, fair enough. But beyond that, you don't really get a sense of what exactly it is that the screamers want what their tactics are or what they're thinking you know i just thought that that kind of thing was explored so much better in something like ex machina Mm. where the whole idea of what is it that that character is thinking is the fascinating central part of the whole movie whereas with this it's just oh in this scene we need jessica to be able to do this so now she can do that Mm. and we were told that they could do basic phrases so you'd have a wounded soldier screamer to lure people in that just screamed help me help me and that makes sense but then the next screamer you see is capable of complex conversations yeah and yet when becca is wounded after the explosion he reverts back to the wounded soldier thing and just starts screaming help me help me and somebody falls for it jefferson falls for it yeah you think why is he doing that now everybody knows i knew that was coming i knew that that meant he was a screamer i don't know it just didn't the logic just didn't make any sense to me no not at all even just the fact that you have your basic screamer which is some sort of buzzsaw pretty much that tunnels on the ground and then suddenly everything is like a rock is a screamer Mm. and a child is a screamer so there wasn't sort of an incremental reveal of all these screamers it was just suddenly everything was (laughs) possible of killing you and so there wasn't any sense of tension because i just thought oh well you know his shoe could be a screamer like what what, what next yeah it's true yeah there wasn't really much tension because once you got to the 86th reveal that somebody was a screamer i just thought well everybody is aren't they (laughs) i give up probably the last one is peter weller is too which of, of course what they did in blade runner in some versions of blade runner depending on which one you believe in ah uh, yes. it sort of hints that Deckard may be a replicant as well mm, it mm. didn't work i didn't think that aspect of it what do you think of the 90s cgi action sequences well it was quite nostalgic for me but oddly enough not of movies from the 90s but of pc video games from, ah, <laughs> from the right, 90s yes. especially the escape shuttle lifting off at the end i thought oh yeah it looks like a cut scene from like command and conquer or something that's what i thought to. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are some impressive special effects sequences in it. In particular, I do like all of the matte painting work. I thought the landscapes that they created for Sirius 6B were very impressive. It wasn't obvious to me where the painting stopped and the set began. And the location was just amazing. Location was incredible. I felt that as soon as they left the base at the start, mm. suddenly we were immersed in an actual film. Yeah. The base was awful. Yeah. It felt like anything could just fall over at any minute and everything was just <laughs> gaffer taped together and spray painted silver. Oh, it was not convincing at all. And it did that 90s thing where actors just look far too clean. Yes. You're in a post nuclear war wasteland. Why does everyone look like they're freshly showered and they're wearing perfectly pressed brown uniforms that look yeah. ugly? <laughs> uh, and, and cheap yeah, as well. So cheap. The start of the movie just screamed to me, I mean, pun intended, I guess, uh, <laughs> screamed to me like TV movie. Like it had a mm. very TV movie vibe to it. And I was very surprised when I looked at the budget for this film because it's 20 million. Yeah. Where did they put the money? I mean, that's a pretty good mid sized budget for a movie that in is the early 90s. Huge. Yeah. You compare that to Antiviral, which we covered last episode, they had a budget of 3 million. Mm. And it looks way better. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Different type of movie, obviously. I was going to try to give Screamers a break because they are trying to create a whole world, but then Antiviral created a whole world as well, and they managed to do that. I mean, granted, it was white, empty spaces yeah. most of the time. But no, the bases weren't very good. It's one of those things where they used an industrial complex 
and just strapped a few lights and yeah. lasers to it. To yeah. <laughs> that it looked sort of futuristic. I think it was a paint manufacturing plant or oh, something like that. Right. Something I, like that. I yeah. don't understand why 90s sci fi, they just have to stick geometric shapes everywhere. Like mm. the TV screen is hexagonal. Of course. For some reason. Yeah. You know, because it's the future. Yeah. <laughs> and we have hexagonal TV screens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Going back to the screamers themselves, I liked the effect of them burrowing underground. I thought that was actually really good. Mm. Having sort of the soil and sand sort of billow up as they're moving underground. Yeah. But as soon as they were revealed, it was just awful. I don't know, CGI or whether it was just bad compositing, but they did not look very scary. No, it's composited stop-motion animation created by the Chiodo brothers. Right. Who worked on Killer Clowns from Outer Space. So they're really competent guys, but it's just the limitations of optical compositing. It doesn't look like it's there. And also, I mean, it makes you realise just how advanced Blade Runner was in 1982, just in terms of how it depicts technology, that the replicants are based on, I mean, it seems like super advanced genetic engineering. They're organic, aren't they? Whereas the Screamers, it's the old sort of 60s, 70s thing of when you rip them open, you know, lots of leftovers from Radio Shack pour out. Yeah. Sort yeah. of very believable technological advancement for 70 years in the future, I don't think, in terms of where we're headed. Yeah. There's also a reveal of David, the child Screamer. Mm. Not the one that gets blown up, but a later one that appears in... <laughs> It's CGI, right? Where his mouth turns into like a million teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Is that CGI? I think it could be CGI or it could be stop motion again. I mean, it's quick. It is quick. They don't linger on it. Mm. Again, it just fits into that whole bracket of the screamers can do this now. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. Why? Yeah. If this is an infiltration unit, why would they do that? James Cameron did a better job of this, I think, in The Terminator, because again, it's an infiltration unit. It's because they realised that hunter killers or whatever they were weren't going to pick off all of humanity. So they start sending robots that look like humans to try and invade the camps. And mm. I think Reese says the first ones had rubber skin. We spotted them easy, but these ones are cybernetic organisms with flesh on the outside. So we can't spot them that's mm. more effective if that's what the screamers are doing great but then yeah. why, why would they make it so they can animate into a big face of teeth <laughs> that's not very sensible is it that makes oh, no sense no no, <laughs> no. i feel like this movie could have been better if they sort of injected a little bit more either more gore mm. i mean there were some pretty horrific scenes the first scene with the guy getting his arm and leg cut off yeah but you never see him get properly killed no and everybody turns away from the window and vomits on the floor because obviously what's going on out there is so revolting but we don't get to see it yeah yeah <laughs> if it's gonna be a, a schlocky sci-fi horror b-grade movie at least make it gruesome you know like intruder style yeah. just show everything mm. as much blood as possible but it didn't do that and another thing it didn't do was it didn't have any humor Apart from Jefferson, I will say his character was actually pretty hilarious. Yeah. But everything else was just so serious. Like, I got bored a lot of the scenes. Yeah. It was just too much brooding. Yeah, it's 108 minutes and it certainly feels like it, I would say. Part of the problem is structurally, as I've said, there are just too many reveals that people are robots. Yes. Once they've survived the big action scene at the base with the thousands of Davids and the massive nuclear explosion, apparently, but small enough not to annihilate all of them somehow. A nuclear explosion from like the tiniest missile you've ever seen. Like I know. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It looks like they made it out of like a model aeroplane yes. or something that's painted it like a missile. <laughs> yeah, it's not very convincing. But after that, that's for me feels like the third act climax. And then you have the tacked on and now we go to the escape shuttle. Oh, but there's one more thing to kill. And then there's another thing to kill. Like, yes. Oh. 
Yeah. You know, I was waiting for the extended sequence of Peter Weller fighting a teddy bear in the cockpit of his spaceship <laughs> at that point. It's like Return of the King right. in terms of too many endings. So yeah, it overstays mm. its welcome. It does. I mean, I was going to say, it does do the thing that you don't often get in this type of movie, which is it spends some time with the characters. I don't know whether you found that boring, but seeing Hendrickson with his friend Chuck. Right. And I was sort of convinced by that whole old soldiers who'd been through lots of battles together and been posted on lots of places reminiscing about that bar and do you remember what happened here? And the little sort of snippets of Hendrickson's marriage breaking down. And they spent some time on the characters which you don't usually get and mm. that feels like something that would have needed to be in there to get Peter Weller to sign on the dotted line in the first place. Mm. I did appreciate the attempt at character development and more fleshed out characters, but I did find, yeah, I did find most of those scenes quite boring. <laughs> and Peter Weller as an actor really stood out from everyone else. Like yeah. there were scenes where, because his acting is great, it felt almost out of place. Yes. Like yeah. the scene <laughs> where he's talking to Jefferson and there's a reveal that there's no war on this planet anymore and they've been left to fend for themselves. And... Peter Weller's character Hendrickson gets very down on the whole thing and and ends up screaming, get out! But it just seems like overacting at that point. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. He's a fine actor, but it's almost like he was trying too hard. Yeah, I think he's very good in this, though. I buy him as this gruff authority figure. Yeah, I do, I do. When you compare it to something like Leviathan, which we might do at some point, the um, underwater alien thriller from, I think it's about 89. Okay. I think everybody is terrible in that movie. Okay. And so he's right at home because he's <laughs> right. terrible too. I don't buy his character in that one. Whereas in this one, I completely buy him as this character. Oh, right. He's this philosophical man of war who believes in something. Mm. I really like that line that he comes out with when I think it's Jefferson that says to him, who made you sign up for this war? And he says, not who, what? So he believes in something. He's a principled man. Mm, and right. yes, yes. his love scenes with Jessica, I buy them. He really cares about her and he's desperate to salvage one good thing from this terrible mess. Really? I don't buy the love stuff. I think it's so shoehorned in there. Oh. It just seems really out of place. It's the typical 80s, 90s action slash sci-fi thing where they just throw in a love scene because there's a girl Yeah, and she has to fall in love despite only meeting him like a day before. Yeah. I mean, the scene where she, for no reason, takes all of her clothes off and bathes herself yeah. in front of him. What? What is she doing? She's just met this guy. Hi, I'm taking my top off. <laughs> what? <laughs> So he's talking to her, trying to ignore it because it's, I don't know, it's like a Paul Verhoeven thing where men and women just undress in front of each other Mm -hmm. and it's not a big deal because he always had those unisex locker rooms in Robocop and Starship Troopers. Yeah, I did actually have Starship Troopers vibes watching this movie. Yeah, I know, because that movie does look kind of plasticky and cheap as well, doesn't it? But it kind of does it on purpose, I feel. That's the thing. It's ridiculous and campy on purpose, whereas this... Oh, it's too serious. Yeah, it is. Too serious. Mm. And that scene where you have um, Hendrickson and Jessica kissing in the smouldering aftermath next to two halves of Becca <laughs> while the orchestral and choral music <laughs> swells in the background. Yeah. I did laugh. Yeah. I did laugh a lot. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it was just ludicrous. At that point, I was just like, I just give up. I don't even want to try to understand this movie. It's ridiculous. I did like... <laughs> The sort of camaraderie slash banter between Hendrickson and Jefferson, though. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of Shrek. <laughs> Hendrickson was Shrek and <laughs> Jefferson was the donkey. And he just wouldn't shut up. He was just talking about cooking rats and putting frogs in the microwave. <laughs> that's a really um, good comparison. That did yeah. not occur to me, but that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of liked it. That he was the annoying funny guy that just wouldn't shut up and there was that sort of understanding they respected each other but um but then the scene where jefferson ends up dying just it seemed too quick it almost seemed like oh he's dead 
Moving on. Yeah, I know it was too quick and it didn't have any emotional weight to it because no it, emotion, it, just, no. it just seemed to happen too fast and too throwaway. And it was a bit of a shame, really, because I really liked him. In fact, I think the first time I watched it, I must have blinked during that moment. And then suddenly I, in the third act, I was thinking to myself, where's Jefferson gone? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how bad it was. Yeah. Yeah. I did find there wasn't any humanity when people died, even when Ross died, mm. when he was stabbed with the giant knife by Becca. <laughs> and it turns out he, in fact, wasn't a screamer. Mm. It was kind of, oh, that's shocking. Oh, I guess, what a waste. Oh, well. There wasn't any sort of like, oh, my God, you just killed a human being. What the fuck? Yeah. But it was just, ah, oh, we're just moving on. We shouldn't trust this person anymore. We should tie him up and put him in the corner or, you know, something. Yeah. There should be consequences. Yeah. But you just have Hendrickson say, all I see is a human life got wasted for no reason. Okay. Yeah. And we move on. Cold. So cold. I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now it's time for Random Trivia! So Dan, what fascinating nugget of trivia have you pulled out of the smouldering wreckage of a robot boy today? <laughs> oh, that's been disturbing. Um, well, <laughs> you have already mentioned that originally the story that Philip K. Dick came up with was it was set on Earth oh. between the Americans and the Russians. But there are some more differences between the story and the movie. Mm. So originally the screamers were called Claws, oh. C-L-A-W-S, uh, because they had claws, I guess. Um, <laughs> and it was set on Earth and the Jessica character was actually a Russian named Tasso. Tasso, oh. who actually did in the original story convinces Hendrickson that she should fly in the rocket and ah. he should stay back. And what happens is he's fending off all these screamers trying to attack him, uh, or claws, I guess. And there are a whole bunch of Davids, little kids, and wounded yeah. soldiers. And also, Tassos, or I guess Jessica equivalents, start also popping up and attacking him. So then he realizes, oh shit, oh. Tasso, or Jessica, that's confusing, um, was actually a screamer and has now shot off to go for help and, I guess, destroy humanity as we know it. Yeah, that's a much better ending. I know, that would have been a really <laughs> cool ending, but of course I had to end that love story uh. with the evil twin because, you know, you can't have the love interest be evil. No. You have to have the evil twin be evil. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's a shame, though. I do like that ending. It's very Philip K. Dick, though, that isn't is. it? <laughs> it is, yes, yes. The doomed ending, yeah. So I had a piece of trivia, too. You mentioned Phantasm, and oddly enough, during this film's long, protracted development process, because Dan O'Banner wrote it in the early 80s, and it, they right, kept trying yes. to make it all the way through the 80s and 90s, and eventually ended up being this. But at one point, Don Coscarelli was attached to it as director. Oh, wow. As a low-budget 80s movie. Yeah. Wow, that would have been really interesting. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen what he would have done with it. Yeah, probably a lot of prog rock. <laughs> <laughs> and flying balls. <laughs> and that's our trivia. <laughs> So, Dan, you didn't find the romantic scenes particularly convincing, despite the beautiful swelling music behind it. What did you think of the music by Normand Corbeil? Corbeil? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It was okay. I mean, there was a theme that reoccurred. Uh, hmm. I don't know. There were parts of the score that was very, like, Terminator rip-off-y. Hmm. For the most part, it did its job. And, I mean, I hate to be critical but it wasn't very memorable no i was quite surprised by the big romantic theme i quite liked that one yeah and i was surprised because it clearly had a full orchestra and a choir behind it even though other portions of the school sounded very synthetic yes i think maybe it was one of those cases where because of their budget they hired an orchestra for two or three cues yeah and used them strategically in big places which isn't a bad approach I can appreciate that, especially in the 90s. I think it seemed to be more expensive to do that kind of score back then. Yeah, sure, sure. 
I appreciated the orchestra, mm. but I don't know. It was very forgettable. In terms of what it reminded me of, it sort of reminded me of Dune, Toto's music for Dune. Oh, okay, I haven't seen Dune, so. <laughs> ah, yeah, it reminded me of that in terms of the big orchestral grandeur of it. And of course, with it being in the sand and with creatures burrowing under the sand. Oh, right, similarities. Yes. There are those similarities there. Tremors as well was another thing that I thought of, although mm. not musically. Yes, I thought of Tremors 100%. Yeah, and I think the music influenced other people as well because it sounds a lot like Graham Ravel's score for Pitch Black, which came about seven years later. Ah. Yeah, you compare the opening titles of those two movies and they're quite similar, actually. (laughs) Pitch Black and Screamers? Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. It has to be said when we're talking about references and what things sound like, this movie is sort of a rip-off of quite a few things. I mean, there's a lot of very, very strong influences, let's put it that way. Aliens? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Aliens does loom large in the background Mm -hmm. of this movie. You've got the prepubescent kid with a toy that they find in the smouldering aftermath having inexplicably survived. Mm -hmm. In Aliens, it turns out that Newt's just resourceful and clever. In this movie, it turns out that David is a trap. And then you have a group of futuristic soldiers descending into the sub-level of an industrial complex on an alien world to find out what happened to the people who are stationed there and then find a room full of blood smears and signs of a struggle and immediately are set upon by small, bitey creatures. Mm, You know. Yeah. I expected Ross to just come out and just say, Game over, man. Game over. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. And you were talking about the archetypes and how, you know, the the cardboard characters don't really lift off the page particularly. And I think it's because James Cameron established all of those archetypes in Aliens in 1986. And every movie that followed afterwards just found itself doing the same thing, but not as well. Yeah, I did find the creature, one of the screamers that they see looks very similar to a Geiger like alien yeah that's a good point it does it's all sort of scaly and biomechanical in a way yeah Yeah. it's kind of got all these invertebrate bone segments and Yeah, yeah you're right they're landmarks so Aliens and the Terminator just influenced a lot of sci-fi and Mm. especially a lot of stuff that had to be done quickly and cheaply for the direct-to-video market, which I think that's what this is. I think it is a direct-to-video job. But $20 million for a budget, though, that's a lot. Mm. I mean, according to IMDb, which is often wrong, it says budget of $20 million, opening weekend in USA... 2.9 2.9 million. Oh. Cumulative worldwide gross, 5.7 million. That's pretty shit. <laughs> That's not good, is it? No. I mean, they do say that they think that it found more of an audience on home video afterwards. Right. And I can imagine that if you're a huge fan of Aliens and you just want to see other riffs on Aliens, that this would be a fun movie to watch on a late night with a few beers. Yeah. I watched this movie with my wife and she immediately in the first 10 minutes got bored and said to me, this is a guy's movie. Right. (laughs) There's nothing at all appealing for a female in this movie. Not even the romance? Uh, Yeah, she... Yeah, no. No? (laughs) She wasn't swept off her feet by the romance of kissing somebody in the smouldering aftermath of a nuclear explosion with bits of dead robot around you. Yeah, with a guy that she'd just met a day before. Yeah, of course. (laughs) And did a stand-up sponge bath in front of her. Well, no, she was not impressed by that. The female representation in the movie, was that encouraging in any way? Did Hannah have any thoughts on that? Because no. No. The main point that she had about it being a guy's movie was there was no attractive men in it. Oh, (laughs) not even Andy Lau? Because Peter Weller's not an unattractive guy, Mm. but he's sort of that attractiveness that was only really attractive in the 80s and 90s (laughs) and is not really attractive anymore. (laughs) Yeah, he's kind of chiseled. It does harken back from a period where your leading actor could be a little bit older, whereas now you tend to watch movies and everybody's 22, Mm -hmm. which is ridiculous when it's the remake of the Amityville Horror and she's got six kids. 
Yeah. You think, I know. Well, when did she start having these kids? When she was 12? <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, there is that. No, I just wondered because it does show a lot of women in positions of authority. Even from the very beginning, I think the lieutenant that's in charge of that bunker, mm. it's a woman. Right, and right, right. The, um, is it the NEB or the Alliance that they meet up with? I can't remember. That camp is led by Jessica. So yes. every camp they encounter has got a woman in charge of it, which is quite nice. Oh, yeah. But then they just take their clothes off and sponge themselves down, which is a bit yeah, of a shock. <laughs> not so good. Or, you know, she ends up kissing the main guy for no apparent reason and then yeah. sacrifices herself for him so he can go home and she can't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've seen this movie before. I don't remember anything of it. Really? At all. That's indicative of how I felt about it last time I watched it. Mm. But it did have this kind of almost cosy feeling. Watching this movie it brought me back to when I was a student at university, just moved out of home, and what do students do? They stay up late. Back then, there was barely anything on the internet. No. You just watched shitty late-night movies on TV, and this is one of those type of movies they would have played. Yeah. And it kind of gave me this sort of, like, warm feeling of, like, oh, yeah, I, I definitely would have watched this movie late at night. And I probably would have enjoyed it. Yeah. Because it kind of just has just enough enjoyment and interest to make you want to watch it because there's literally nothing else to watch <laughs> because we have just the TV and whatever's playing on the channel. So yeah, I can understand why people do like this movie. Yeah, It has that really shitty late night <laughs> 90s TV movie vibe in the best ways, yeah. if that makes any sense. But yeah, I can see it probably does have nostalgia and especially for the, I found this on the shelf at Blockbuster and I thought I'd give it a whirl because it's got Robocop in it and the guy that wrote Alien. Yeah. So you can see why you would do that and then you'd watch it with your, like, I. this is the kind of thing I would watch with my brother all the time. Sure. So yeah. I can see why it would have that kind of appeal. Mm. There's a movie that me and my friend uh, Jono watch really late at night. It's just a sh really bad movie but it was a sci-fi and it was called i think it was called prototype i managed to find it after google searching post-apocalyptic world with a robot killer oh, and finding thousands of movies that fit that description but anyway i found out it was prototype and it's exactly like this movie just a horrendous film that's just good enough to keep you entertained at 1 a.m. in the morning yeah. because nothing else is on. <laughs> Sounds like the sort of thing you'd find Rutger Hauer slumming in in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. yeah. So uh, any other thoughts? Um, one thing that I did kind of laugh at was their solution to not getting any radiation poisoning was to smoke a red cigarette. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, I don't know. And it kind of made sense in terms of if you're getting radiated particles in your lungs, then breathing something else in to counteract it makes sense. Yeah. But, I mean, what do you do about the stuff that's on your skin and gamma rays? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it made zero sense. And also such a thing that a 90s movie would do. Because in the 90s, you know, smoking was rebellious and like the bad boy thing to do. Yeah. Whereas now it's just that would not be in a movie ever. No, it doesn't happen anymore. You're right, that was the bridge, wasn't it? Because in the 80s, mm. everybody smoked everywhere. So whenever you watch an 80s movie, it's quite disturbing. Ah, oh, when you watch 50s movies or 40s movies, yeah. every single character is smoking. Yeah. No matter what their gender is, no matter what their age is, like smoking <laughs> didn't have the connotation of the bad character or the rebellious character. It was just... no. Everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, children, pets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everywhere as well. In a car, in the toilet, in a bank. Serving food. <laughs> Although I have to say, I've been in Paris a few times and been served by people in delis that were smoking. <laughs> right. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> but that's Paris for you. <laughs> Still sophisticated over there. Oh, yeah, they make it work. <laughs> Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Movie Awards. It's the Movie Awards. Let's see what our favourite berinium polluted parts of the film are in a number of gotcha, it's actually a screamer categories. Best quote. 
I've already mentioned that I love the sort of banter between Jefferson and Hendrickson. And I did mm. actually mention the quote I'm about to recall, but I love the bit where he's talking to David and talking about microwaves for some reason. So he goes, <laughs> if you put a teddy bear like yours in the microwave, nothing will happen. But a frog, especially if it's wet, <laughs> and he <laughs> just... Why? Why is he talking about putting frogs in the microwave? And then, of course, Hendrickson responds, Shut up, Jefferson, which is a very Shrek thing to say. Yeah, although I don't remember Donkey talking about exploding frogs (laughs) or watching porn on a virtual reality visor. No, not very uh, G-rated there. No. How about you, Conrad? Favourite quote? My absolute favourite to Jefferson is, Are you coming or are you just breathing hard? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Which is appalling. Did Peter Weller just say that in 1995 to another man? Mm. Yes. There you go. (laughs) Wow. Best hair or costume? I do have to mention Becker. So the douchebag of this film is Mm. just your stereotyped 90s bad guy. So he's not an 80s bad guy with a leather jacket and a mullet. He's a 90s bad guy, (laughs) and a 90s bad guy is an extreme sport snowboarder. (laughs) That's what he looks like. He's got like a a ski suit, jumpsuit. He's got these kind of wraparound, douchey, reflective ski sunglasses on. Yeah, that were uh, obviously a nightmare for the cinematographer because I keep seeing the crew in them. (laughs) Oh, really? I did not notice that. Oh, wow. (laughs) Wow, wow. And, you know, to top it off, he's got the the teardrop tattoos under his eyes Mm. and he licks knives. I mean... Is that a thing that bad guys just do? Bad guys just lick things? I've noticed that. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> it's dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, it's threatening. Ooh, I could cut my tongue in half. Ooh. <laughs> Most 90s moment. For me, I'm going for technology. I know it's an easy pick. It's always so easy to pick out old, dated bits of technology. But when Jefferson started walking through a battlefield while listening to a Sony Discman, I laughed my ass off. Yes, yes, yes. The Discman, yes. I mean, the first one apparently came out in 84, which amazed me. But I just remember them as being everywhere in the early 90s and then gone by the noughties. Wow, I I think New Zealand was just very far behind with technology. (laughs) Because people were using Discman well into the early 2000s. Uh, and then really? and then suddenly iPods took over. But yeah, I remember Discman being really annoying because CDs skip. Yes. So if you <laughs> jumped or tripped or bumped something, your CD skipped. And that was so annoying. It was, yeah. Favourite scene! This might sound horrific, but my favourite scene was the killing all the young kids scene. Yes, Um, me too. (laughs) (laughs) What does that say about us? We're bad people. Oh, it's just, I don't know. I had so much glee watching them just blast a whole bunch of 10-year-old boys holding teddy bears saying, can I come with you? (laughs) And not just blasting them, like setting them on fire so they're sort of stumbling around in flames with their little faces melting. It's so bad. Yeah, I love it. I think it was just a very sort of surreal scene as well. I wasn't expecting it. And and mm. just, yeah, I guess they showed everything. You know, they showed the horrors. Yeah. And even though the masks weren't terribly convincing, that sort of worked as well because they were sort of waxy with these glassy mm. blue eyes and they're just melting with this horrified look on their faces. Yeah. And it was kind of disturbing. I exactly. thought it was really good. Yeah. I think that's why I wanted the movie to end at that point. I thought, yeah, just... End on a high Mm. with a massacre of 10-year-old teddy bear holding kids. (laughs) (laughs) Most cliché sci-fi moment. My sci-fi cliché is the planet has to have multiple suns and or moons. Ah, yeah, Star Wars. (laughs) Otherwise, it's just not an alien planet, is it? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, Star Wars. But everything as well, I mean. That's why I think this movie reminds me of Pitch Black so much, because of the not terribly convincing CGI landscapes with multiple planets on the horizon. I think mm, that's right, kind right. of what it reminds me of. Well, my sci-fi cliche for this film is actually the scrolling text uh, at the start. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it happens anymore. You don't get the obligatory sort of scrolling text setting the scene you know it's the year 2078 and we're on this planet and <laughs> this has all happened and now we start the movie whereas now I, I feel like we just get straight into it yeah best special effect i really like the the creature screamer that i mentioned that looked like a geiger alien type yeah animal was that stop motion i think it I can is never tell with with 80s or 90s movies yeah i think um, it but is. looked really cool lots of sort of moving parts and you could actually see it as well like it wasn't just hidden shadow so yeah very convincing effect way better than the screamers so <laughs> yeah no that's true well the other screamers i guess it was a screamer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For me, I really liked all of the map paintings, I think I mentioned. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They were all by an artist called Deke Ferrand, who is still working to this day. Okay. I loved all of his map shots, and there is one in particular that I was very impressed with because it's a moving map shot. There is a scene where Peter Weller and Andy Lauer, so Hendrickson and Jefferson, Mm. are walking through the landscape, and you see the city behind them and there are layers of map painting that are moving and that's pretty challenging for 1995. Wow, I didn't even notice that. No, it is noticeable because they do come unglued and move at the wrong rate a little bit. Oh, right, okay, but yeah. they are there and I thought, oh, wow, hats off for trying that. That's a bit ambitious for 95. Uh-huh, uh-huh. There you go. Very cool. Favourite sound effect. I had a worst sound effect. <laughs> Back to that again. And I think it's not the sound necessarily, it's just why and it's the binoculars that are on a track at, right at the beginning of the movie oh, in that right, bunker yes. <laughs> and so they're moving the binoculars along this track and you've got this sort of servo motor sound as they move it but why is it a motor because it's not moving by itself is it making the noise because they're forcing what should be an automatic thing mm. along a track why would you attach binoculars to a track anyway? Isn't it more useful to be able to hold them and move around? Yeah, I just, yeah. Everything about the binoculars just <laughs> annoyed me, and the fact that they made a, a sort of metallic servo noise when they weren't moving by themselves just drove me insane. So, <laughs> mm, Right, right. There was one sound in the movie that Hannah, my wife, really hated, and that was the knife oh. sharpening sound that oh, Big is doing. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because Hannah hates the sound of, of chewing and eating sounds. And apparently it, there's a term for it. It's called uh, misophonia. Oh. And people that really get agitated with eating, chewing, breathing heavily sounds, but apparently also repetitive sounds like keyboard clacking and pen clicking. Mm-hmm. But yeah, for me, I don't have a problem with both sounds. <laughs> but I did find <laughs> that screamer screaming sound was like kind of perfect because it was so irritating mm, yeah it was yeah but not not to the point where you couldn't watch the movie which well, is good <laughs> yeah it wasn't oh that's right and push yeah the screaming guys <laughs> that was yeah. really irritating yeah I remember that. Gosh, that's a few episodes ago. (laughs) Yeah, you should tell Hannah that that's a sign of a higher intelligence, apparently. Oh, okay. Well, she'll hear it on the pod. (laughs) I think it's a highly creative person. I think that's what it was. Ah. Highly creative people are annoyed by chewing. Ah. There you go. That makes me very, very uncreative then. (laughs) Because I'm not annoyed. (laughs) Most funniest moment. My funny scene is actually the part where Jefferson is telling that story about that delightful story about how to cook a rat. Oh, God. How you have yeah. to flip it over and <laughs> the oil can't be too hot. Um, and then I love it that <laughs> Hendrickson's response to this is Jefferson, you must be confusing me with someone who gives a shit. <laughs> <It's just laughs> yeah. So cold. Oh, but so, yeah, perfect. Love it. That's one of his best put downs. I like that one. <laughs>
Yes. Yeah. I think the funniest scene was the teddy bear moving right at the end of the movie. Oh, right, yeah. It just looked so ridiculous to me. I couldn't take it seriously at mm, all. No, you couldn't. And, no. yeah, send your audience out laughing. This is the thing. There is this theory that the emotion that you leave your audience with right at the end of the movie it will really strongly influence how they feel about your movie. Uh-huh. So you can have a film that sort of fails an awful lot and then like really pulls it out of the bag in the last five minutes. So you go out thinking, yeah, that was a good movie. Mm-hmm. And this movie ends with the threat of a teddy bear taking over the earth. <laughs> and I laughed throughout the end credits. So yeah, yeah. not good. Way to end your movie. <laughs> Patron's <laughs> Choice. Our Patron's Choice Moobly Award category for this episode comes from Evan, and he wants us to pick the grooviest facial expression in the movie. I don't know whether it would be grooviest, but I would say (laughs) most spine-tingling sleaziest Mm. was when Becca licks the knife with that (laughs) sort of salacious look, and he says... It's never sharp enough. (laughs) I just shivered with disgust. I mean, his character was so intolerable. Yeah. Yuck. I think that's a good call. He does do a lot of great facial expressions, Becca. Like his his default setting is blue steel, I think. Oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) I think mine would have to be his comrade, Ross, who wanders around the whole time in the movie with one of the buckles from his jacket. Oh, yes, yes. Just suckling on a zip tie. In his mouth. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's like he's sucking on, yeah, like a baby or something. So he's permanently talking through gritted teeth mm. with this strand of his coat sticking out of his... Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty groovy. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> Bizarre quirk, I would say. Yeah, it was. It was an interesting character choice, for sure. Yes, yes, indeed. So if you want to suggest a patron's choice category, become a patron on Patreon. Yes. Just for $1 a month, you get to suggest whatever category you want. Yes, and you can be as wild and crazy with it as you like. And it can be specific to the film, or it could just be a general one. So yeah. give us what you got. Yeah. Sign up now. Yes. And that's our move, please. Hurrah! <laughs> Final verdict time. Does Screamers deserve to be released from Sirius 6B, rocketed away for all to be screamed at? Or should it be buried in the ground with the other deadly autonomous mobile swords and shoveled into the oubliette to be lost forever? Conrad, Mm. what fate befalls Screamers? Well, I have to say, I appreciate where you're coming from with the nostalgia value of this movie. It does remind me of the sort of trashy post-Aliens direct-to-video stuff I would watch with my brother late at night. And there are a lot of things about it to commend. There are some great visual effects in it. I think there are some amazing locations. They make the most of their locations to create an alien landscape that sort of snow one minute and a desert the next. It's pretty incredible. Mm. And they take their time to create the characters a little more. And Peter Weller's always interesting to watch in any movie that he's in. And certainly Philip K. Dick is not bad source material to be working from. And this film does engage with his central themes of what it is to be human but I just I never found myself particularly interested (laughs) yeah I did try but it just felt as though it went on too long the logic broke down for me the never-ending sequence of people revealing themselves to be robots in ways that they didn't need to and they would have been more successful if they hadn't and it Mm. just never ended and then there was a teddy bear and so uh, yeah <laughs> i have to say for i appreciate a lot of this movie i think it's better than a lot of director video sci-fi knockoffs of aliens that followed in the wake of aliens it was such an influential movie mm. but in the end i mean i wouldn't sort of ward people away from this movie but i don't think i would recommend it to them either yeah I- how about you 
I think you have to be a very specific person to like this movie. Mm. It's definitely very B grade. And I bet, I bet there are thousands of people out there that love this movie and have a sense of nostalgia, especially watching this movie as a kid. Yeah, It kind of has that going for it. No doubt if I'd seen this when I was younger, I probably would have that same nostalgia. But yes, it's not a great movie. If they were going for B grade, I wish they'd just dialed up the gore by... 300%. It would have been so yeah. much fun. But yeah, the twist after twist after twist just got ridiculous and they broke all the rules so um, the twist didn't have any weight mm. when they were revealed. I would like to see somebody else do something with the source material and apparently yes. there are rumours of a streaming series but I don't know where that stands with COVID right now. But yeah, there have always been rumours that people want to have another crack at it. Yeah, well, this version of his story, I hate to say it, but I was mostly bored. Mm. So, although this poor little movie might say, can I come with you? <laughs> it will not. It will not. <laughs> we can cry, we can bleed, we can fall. Down you go. <laughs> Down. Did you know, Conrad, there is actually a sequel to this movie that came out in 2009. I did read that 2009. Somewhere. And apparently wow. it's way worse. So, <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe we had a close escape. Yet again, my favourite decade fails to produce. So <laughs> We're not doing 90s next time, Conrad, are we? No, we are not. We are going back to my favourite decade, oh, yes. the 80s, and more of a full-on flavour of the horror genre, I think. Uh -huh. So we will be watching the 1986 Irish fantasy horror horror film Rawhead Rex Oh wow, I have not seen this movie No, me neither, and it's based on a story by Clive Barker I went through a big Clive Barker phase as well You have, <laughs> but you haven't seen this one No, 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 I haven't No. So, I mean, this is going to be a Double Blind Indeed. Yeah, I always like those because who knows what will happen. And I'm really interested to see it because like this movie, it's based on the works of a great author. So let's see what they did with it. It's going to be fun. So listeners, if you want to keep up with our future episodes or tell us how wrong we are about Screamers, mm. <laughs> get in touch. We're on all social media platforms Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as Movie Oubliette. Yes, and if you'd like to scream at us via email, oh. then contact us at movie.oubliette at gmail.com. We always love hearing from you. Yes, and like Cody, who gave us a stunning review, uh, oh. if you haven't already, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you are listening to us on. Yes, and if you want to go a step further and support the show, head on over to Patreon, where for a dollar you can suggest Moobly Award categories yes. and nominate films for us to cover in future. And for five dollars you get access to loads of bonus extra material, including longer interviews with some of our special guests. Mm, they're great interviews. They are, yeah. And we've got a new one coming up soon, so watch this space. Mm, exciting. Thanks for joining us, listeners, on this, uh, I guess, very audibly loud journey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, you can take the earplugs out now. <laughs> Bye for now. Goodbye. <laughs> Can't believe you gotta put this shit in your lungs just to neutralize the shit in your lungs. <laughs>